Hey there, welcome back to the Global Supply Chain Week. I'm Andrew Cox, Senior Retail Analyst here at FreightWaves, and we're here to talk about visibility. Visibility has been a hot button issue in our industry since long before the coronavirus pandemic, but the supply and demand shocks felt throughout COVID have only amplified that conversation to new heights. With me to discuss the new level of demand, the new level of collaboration that is occurring in the marketplace, and the future of tracking and visibility is Glenn Kepke, Senior Vice President of Customer Success at Forkites. Glenn, thanks for joining me and welcome to the Global Supply Chain Week. Great to see you again, Andrew. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, I'm, I'm very glad you're here. And I do want to start with that collaboration piece because this is something I've heard from every part of the supply chain so far. I've heard it from retailers. I've heard it from uh, executives at brokerages and carriers that all of them are working more collaboratively with their partners uh, in the supply chain. I wanted to know what that collaboration entails and what's caused the change. Why are retailers and shippers more willing to share their data now than they were a year ago? Yeah, so for one, obviously, you know, the big event the last year was COVID, um, but, you know, technology is an enabler, right? And this technology journey uh, has been underway for a lot of companies over the last five years. And, you know, I think there's a couple parts that really drive it. One is just the, meet, the need to meet consumer demand, right? So as companies are focused on the end customer, they're starting to lift up the covers and see how their operations work. And there's a lot of silos, both from a process, a technology, and a talent perspective. And so technology is helping break up those silos uh, is kind of the first angle. Uh, the second is, as you look at kind of speed of information and the amount of time and energy that's spent to collaborate or quote unquote collaborate, it's really changing, right? Historically, collaboration meant, you know, more emails, uh, faster spreadsheets and so on. You know, what we see today in terms of collaboration, it's really automating a lot, a lot of the redundant workflow and the tactical noise and shifting the strategic focus for growth for companies uh, in a platform type of way to help accelerate that relationship forward. So Glenn, I just, I'm grappling with the idea of uh, the, the times got tough, everybody came together to get through the tough times, but then what's gonna happen when times aren't so tough? Do you think that shippers and retailers revert back to less collaboration when they have the upper hand, when capacity is plentiful and they're not dealing with 30% uh, demand swings? Do you think they revert back to old ways or do you think this collaboration is here to stay? So my take is I think the collaboration is here to stay uh, and there's always curves, right? You look back in uh, any kind of macroeconomic events, there's certain curves. And I do think what the COVID curve is, is that collaboration is 100% here to stay uh, in part because companies just can't easily add resources at the rate they used to, right? There's a lot of cost pressure. Uh, there's a lot of focus on margin and just, you know, market share capture. And so to get there and to stay there, you have to have collaboration in your DNA. Uh, I think what we're going to see is just collaboration continue to morph uh, into different means, one in the B2B world, uh, but also the B2C world. And, you know, one of the unique ways that uh, Forkites has been focused on collaboration within a broader network is around the whole concept of prepaid visibility versus collect visibility, right? So if we're a retailer, about half the freight on average that is coming into my warehouses, I control, right? So I manage the carrier contracts, uh, I manage pickup appointments, I manage delivery appointments, I can see exactly where those things are. The challenge is, is for the other 50%, you don't know, right? And your suppliers are the ones that are controlling that. And so, you know, what Forkites has done to change the game is have that collaborative view of all of the freight that's coming into your warehouse network. And that way, when you think of how your supply chain is being disrupted, it's not just the truck that you're, you're managing and controlling, it's also the truck that your supplier's uh, managing and controlling. And that shared visibility is such a key component. But, you know, to go back to it, collaboration's here to stay. I'm super excited just having been in the industry for 20 years. You know, I think many of us have dreamed about kind of where the market is going, uh, but this is a great impetus for us for the next you know, five to 10 years of supply chain of how we're gonna work and what technology is gonna do to help us all. Well, if collaboration is here to stay, tell me what those dreams entail. Uh, what do you think is the benefits of these, of working more collaboratively, if you're speaking to the retailers and the shippers and the audience, uh, what do you see from people that have used four kites from other retailers? Uh, what have been the benefits in their supply chain to work more collaboratively with both their transportation partners and their suppliers? Yeah, so one, I mean, if you look at like retail networks today, this whole concept of omni-channel has become more prevalent, right? I don't necessarily source through one supply chain network 
um, for each channel, right? I, I have an omni channel where I may share uh, product and inventory at a store level that ships to a consumer where historically there was always a, an e-commerce fulfillment there. So um, omni-channel is one of the unique demands that retailers are faced. How visibility helps it is how do I understand where all of my goods are at any point in time, uh, specifically in transit and at rest. And if I'm going to be behind on inventory availability, how do I work collaboratively with my suppliers to either expedite product or pull product from other locations? So that's just kind of one of the macro examples uh, that we're focused on. Second would be purchase order visibility, right? When you think of how kind of retail supply chains are operating, it's very PO centric, where if you go in the middle of the supply chain, you're gonna have both purchase order, stock transfer orders and sales orders. But one of the things that we see uniquely different is kind of having the, everything come back to the North Star within my supply chain, which isn't really the shipment level, it's the purchase order level. So I know exactly where any commodity is at any point in time in the world, regardless if it's truckload, whether it's parcel, whether it's ocean or air or any mode uh, for that matter. So having that deep integration uh, back into your ERP, but a much more buyer friendly view or a store operations view that they know exactly what's going on uh, kind of in their world. The other thing we see is a lot of collaboration at the store level. So whether it's through uh, direct store delivery or merchandiser type apps, one of the things we've evolved uh, within Forkites is that when you think of like the, the just-in-time planning, right? It's one thing if you're trying to uh, deliver to a warehouse. It's another if you're going to a store or a job site. And if you're trying to marry that up with the labor that's trying to offload the truck, those are things that visibility can impact now in ways that we could only, only dreamed about, right? Historically, that was all done through uh, phone calls, maybe text messages. A lot of it was just guessing. But, you know, in Forkites, what we're doing is help uh, – bringing a platform to that in a very unique mobile app experience to really help uh, the store operators, but also the merchandisers uh, as well. Okay, Glenn, there was a lot to unpack there. So I, I want to swing back around to um, omni-channel, e-commerce, and, uh, and inventory levels in particular when we're talking about just-in-time and changing supply chains. But I do want to talk and explain some more on purchase order tracking because this was a concept that I didn't know all that much about until I started researching for this conversation. So Explain to the audience, uh, especially those in the transportation audience that may not be as familiar with purchase orders, they're more uh, accustomed to their own form of, of, of tracking. Tell them what purchase orders are and what's the benefits in having that one pane of glass through the purchase order uh, from order to delivery. Yeah, so a, a purchase order is, uh, in essence, the, the buyer's request uh, for the commodities that they're looking to acquire from a company. And so uh, if you think of a retailer, I may go buy... Uh, juice boxes, as an example. And so I'm going to issue a purchase order, either you know for the, the, the contents of that order. That content may be the equivalent of one truckload. It could be a, a bulk purchase order, a blanket purchase order, which is good for the whole year. And the reason why it's different is that when you think of how non-logistics teams operate in the supply chain, so uh, purchasing your supply and demand planning team, your customer service, your sales team, they're tending to think at a much more macro view uh, which is that PO level view. So, you know, why is it important is it helps equalize the conversation of what goes on in logistics and transportation to a much broader organization. So for those that are, you know, heavily focused on transportation, we always think of things as shipments and shipments often come out of transportation management systems where POs, they're native to an ERP system. And there is a clear linkage between a purchase order and a TMS system often. But what we're doing is taking that kind of, uh, that one silo out of the mix and these, this visibility that we're able to provide on a shipment level, we can bring all the way back up to a commodity level. So if I think of truck A, which is, you know, currently in Goodlitzville, Tennessee, you know, the key is what's on the truck, right? And if, if what's on the truck is going to cause a delay in my supply planning, how do I then take a action to potentially draw a product from another fulfillment center or warehouse, or potentially uh, have the supplier uh, expedite the goods to me, so I don't have a stock out at my grocery store. This does—it seems like a big undertaking, you know, changing the tracking standardization uh, for the for this industry. What are the challenges of changing the standardization of tracking language between all the parties involved? Yeah, so I would say you know it's really a change management exercise. So uh, the challenge is one, just technical integration, right? So it, it introduces uh, integration further upstream in the supply chain, typically with the PO system 
uh, or an ERP system? And then also what processes are going on, right? One of the things that technology is, the tension's always been there is, can technology really cover up bad underlying processes? And what we find is that it absolutely can help augment, but there's still an element of like who your DNA is from a company perspective. And so what we often say is these are change management exercises and you have to put the right resourcing and level of effort to make sure that whether it's your visibility platform, your TMS, uh, your purchase order execution or inventory systems, you know, what you're putting in is what you're getting out. And so really at the end of the day, it's technical integration and it's business process mapping uh, that is so key and making sure that you have the right resources to do this. Um, from a value perspective, right, when you think of visibility, oftentimes people think of logistics visibility, which is my, my, shipment, or my shipment planning team, my transportation team, my warehousing team. It is so much broader than that, though. It's your sales team. It's your customer service team. It's your supply and demand planning team. It, it's your store operations, right? So you're really going from a nucleus of, say, a couple hundred people to thousands of people now when you're able to get that order level visibility across your supply chain. So, uh, Glenn, you touched on something that I've been thinking about, and, and this is just, you know, the mass amounts of data that is out there in the market that is being created. Uh, you know, a lot of it is not good data. A lot of it's bad data. As you said, a lot of it is siloed still. At what point is there too much data? Like, how should technology providers approach the masses of data that's being created right now to be able to offer visibility in a simple, effective, and, and actionable way? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, that's a good, great question. If uh, Is there a point of too much data? I think there's a lot of noise that we create where more data equals better results, which isn't always true. Uh, I, I do think one of the challenges as a buyer in this market is there's always the next great thing, right? And right now, a lot of people use AI or ML very universally, right? But the reality is, is you have to get back to, you know, from a DNA perspective of my company, what's my core mission? What's my vision? Right. If it's consumer first, let's say competitive approach. All right. That's great. But then from a challenge perspective, what are the things I'm trying to solve within my operation? Right. And you really have to make sure as you invest in technology, you invest in process improvement. There's a clear why and that there's a clear use case that you can prove out. And so, you know, my take is I don't think we're at a place of too much data. Um, I, I think we're at a place where there has to be more intelligent data that it doesn't take a business analyst, you know, hours or days to sift through and technology providers like Forkites provide this information back, right? You can go to live.forkites.com right now and look at cross-border delays. Uh, you can look at port congestion. You can look at supply and demand by state and dwell time. And to me, that's an example where there's a massive amount of data there, but we're able to package it in a way that's very easy for the end user to understand. That end user may be a journalist, it may be a 30 year transportation veteran that's looking at it. And so, you know, my take, the challenge for companies like Forkites and others is how do you take all this data and simplify it to the end user where that adoption curve is so minimal? Well, let's talk about the future of tracking visibility. Uh, you talked a little bit about your dreams that we're kind of encroaching upon a place where a lot of people in the industry have dreamt of us once going. I think that that involves this single pane of glass that I've heard your CEO, Matthew Ellen Jekyll, reference many times. Can you explain what that is, this single pane of glass and how Forkites is, is helping to achieve it? Yeah, so a single pane of glass is, you know, one place for one version of the truth. And if you look at how supply chains have operated, uh, I've been in the industry for 20 years, and I think of how, you know, the stages have happened. When I think of 10 years ago, 15 years ago, you know, I had a truckload team, I had an LTL team, I had a parcel team, and then I had an air and ocean team. And each of those teams had their own solution, they had their own providers, and that's kind of morphed over time. Where it's changed is you have executive uh, supply chain operators that own multiple regions and multiple modes now, and you start to see providers like Forkites that do offer global and multimodal solutions. And so that idea of a single plane of glass is I've got one service provider or one platform to give me the truth that I need. And that way I don't have to go to five, six or seven different providers what's going on. So if you think about if I'm a buyer and I buy goods from, let's say, China, it's going via, let's say, road freight in, in mainland China. It's then going via ocean from China to, let's say, Long Beach. Once it hits the, the U.S. port, it may go via drayage to a rail terminal and then from rail to truckload. Well, if I have all of these fragmented solutions, trying to impact the end user and get speed to answer within a minute, which wouldn't be feasible. 
Because what you're going to be left with is, all right, now I have to go to five or six different providers just to quickly understand, it, are the goods going to arrive on time or not? And if they're not going to arrive on time, what's the revised ETA? So that single plane of, pane of glass concept for us has been our critical mission since day one, and we continue to live it out. Um, and what we see is, you know, that, that second variation and evol evolution of that is what we talked about with a purchase order visibility or broader order visibility. And so how do I integrate that user experience and that single plane of glass to my supplier network, my supplier's uh, supplier network? And that way I really have a full picture of what's going on, regardless of where the freight is in the world. Glenn, how does capacity influence the demand for tracking and visibility? In other words, looking back at 2020, uh, if capacity would have been plentiful, do you still think that there'd be the same new elevated level of demand for tracking and visibility? I do. Uh, if you think of this concept of like shipper of choice or company of choice, partner of choice, you know, that, that messaging has been around for 10 years. When you look at, you know, how the U.S. trucking economics work, you know, truck drivers having to wait at every stop. Right. If I look, uh, show up for pickup, you know, the average free time is two hours. When I have a, a delivery, I wait another two hours. And so where we see demand, it's going to continue to, to increase in regardless of COVID-19. This would have happened. And a lot of it centered around how do I become a driver friendly operation? Number one, two, customers have expected to know where their goods are at any given time. Right. They just accepted not knowing. Uh, much longer than most industries. So, you know, whether it's the Amazon effect or the Domino's pizza tracker effect, which also comes up, you know, those have been in place pre-COVID and demands are going to continue to rise. But, you know, in our world, it's just magnified the need and it's really helped accelerate uh, the time from ideation all the way to, to implementation because of uh, what's happened in the world. Glenn, I'm glad you mentioned the Domino's Pizza Tracker. It's been around for a long time, and I think from an outsider's perspective, seeing the way the Domino's can track down to the second uh, your your purchase, your order, and your delivery of your pizza is, is something that people look at this industry and wonder why we don't have that across our supply chains. But I also wanted to talk a little bit about driver-friendly operations. You're right, Shipper of Choice is something that's been around for many years. The Freight Wave Shipper of Choice nominations are open right now. We'll put a link in the show notes here for everybody uh, to go and nominate your favorite shipper. But in, in line with creating a more driver-friendly operation, where does visibility play into that uh, with regards to drop and hook operations? We've seen big demand for that over the past year from carriers and from shippers. Just talk me through some of the visibility and, uh, and drop and hook and carriers or shippers just trying to create a more driver-friendly operation. Yeah, so I think you know what we see is an improved check-in process. So, you know, one of the things that Forkites has gotten into is the yard management space. So we've linked yard management and uh, real-time visibility together, right, with the idea that if I know a truck's going to be two hours early to my warehouse for pickup, and let's say there's another truck that's going to be two hours late, how do I shift my warehouse labor, right? The end value is that I am not waiting, making a driver wait in my facility. And so, you know, from an impact to the driver-friendly standpoint, it's ultimately reducing dwell and reducing waiting time, right? Drivers do not want to sit and wait. They're paid to drive. That's what they enjoy doing. And so the more time that they're stuck waiting, uh, it does cause an impact on detention charges. Typically that stuff gets built into freight rates as well. And then just overall, you know, satisfaction with those sites um, does increase and, or dissatisfaction, excuse me. On the drop and hook side, it's really common uh, in retail. I mean, it's obviously well established with, with companies like Walmart, their drop and hook program, you know, Amazon tends to be the opposite where it's, you know, very live load uh, centric. And so uh, drop and hook operations, we do see uh, benefits of reduced dwell time uh, because of the nature of the beast, but it does impact capacity planning a little bit. Uh, one of the reasons why Forkites entered the yard management space is because of drop and hook operations, right? There's a lot of cases where you have a retailer that has inventory sitting in their yard. And because that yard integration isn't really seamless with their WMS. They actually don't know that they have uh, inventory sitting on hand that they could pull from and, and not get out of stocks at their operation. And so, you know, those are just a couple examples. You know, I think when, when people associate, if I could kind of go back to your Domino's pizza tracker example, the reason why Domino's can do it is everything's forced into a mobile app, right? If you think of an Uber or a Lyft, the same thing. The challenge with the U.S. trucking market specifically is you have you know, 1.7 million drivers, I think 800,000 uh, trucking companies, give or take, with a majority of the market being less than 20 trucks, right? So you just have a, a mass fragmentation of the 
uh, operating systems, whether it's TMS, dispatch systems, ELDs, GPS providers. And so trying to get everyone to one mobile app would be easy if everyone used the same mobile app. But if there's 300 mobile apps I have to choose from, it's kind of hard if I were to go be a long haul truck driver and figure out which one to choose from, right? My personal life on my mobile app, I probably have, I don't know, 30 apps, but I know where they are. If I tried to use that many tracking apps, it'd be very challenging. And so, you know, it, it is something that our industry does aspire to is to really have that full transparency. Uh, but because of the market factors, it does uh, prevent unique challenges. Uh, Glenn, yeah, you're totally right about flag fragmentation. I think I've read 96% of the carriers have less than 20 trucks, so extremely fragmented. I wanted to circle back to our first topic, and that was collaboration. And and I think we've and, and I want to look at it through the lens of inventories because you've mentioned inventories uh, in, in your last answer there, and inventories have been a big topic of discussion, especially right now. Their inventories are at some of the lowest levels we've had in six years, but it's not like that for every industry. Some industries like apparel actually have more inventory on hand than they did last year because they really ran lean through the end of the year. Uh, they actually were able to grow profits while having lower sales. So through that prudence, they actually saved uh, much many of their years in the back half. So I just wanted to ask you, what role does uh, collaboration play in running a lean supply chain? Because a lot of these companies have really low inventories right now. They're, work, they're looking to work more collaboratively. Is it that um, running a lean supply chain, want, wanting to run a more efficient supply chain, leads to more collaboration, leads to needing more collaboration, or is it the other way around, that working more collaboratively just naturally opens up the ability to run leaner, uh, run a leaner supply chain? So I think it depends on the demographics of the company. You know, I'd say for uh, legacy companies, you know, the need for being lean has forced collaboration, where when you have more modern companies that have scaled their supply chain in recent years with more modern tech stacks, you know, they've known what collaboration can do. And so, you know, when I think of, you know, what's the value prop for collaboration on inventory specifically is it's really trust and confidence, right? It's how do I know that if I'm going to lower, let's say, my safety stock level from, from X to Y, how do I make sure that I'm not just setting my business up for a disaster, right? And where I have excess safety stock, how do I work collaboratively with those suppliers uh, or those warehouse operators to make sure that I do know when a disruption does happen, I've got an alternative source to uh, to pull from. And so when you think of, you know, the big dollars of where does visibility impact, safety stock is absolutely one of them. And, you know, many companies, you know, they may have had poor process, but COVID actually helped accelerate their sales, right? Because they're in high demand. They they had excess buffer that they weren't necessarily planning for. They were able to sell it very quickly. And then other companies that actually ran pretty lean got caught. And so I think one of the course corrections we'll see post COVID is, you know, what is the right balance do you plan for a pandemic, right? Do you plan for just standard business uh, disruptions? What's really going to go on? And so, you know, I do know many supply chains are are focusing on what's the impact of supply and demand and what are the key metrics that we're going to put in place in the post-COVID area? Glenn, certainly a topic we're going to hear a lot about throughout this entire week, just in time versus just in case or somewhere in between. I think we're going to land somewhere in between with a lot of companies having some of that safety stock to make sure there's not the type of stockouts that we saw. Honestly, throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, I do think that they've learned, uh, from, un learned from that and will keep levels replenished. But I also think that they did learn a lot of lessons from their prudence, uh, especially apparel retailers in the back half of the year that dropped down uh, a lot of SKUs, squeezed higher margins and higher profits off smaller SKUs and, and fewer sales. So I think we've got an interesting year ahead of us. I'm, I'm going to be watching inventories very closely uh, over the next couple of months. But Glenn, I want to thank you so much for your time today. I also wanted to give you the chance to get, give everybody listening uh, where to go to find more information about Forkites and know more about your products. Yeah, well, thanks for having me on, Andrew. It's good to see you again, as always. And if you're interested to learn more, you can go to forkites.com. Uh, to see our new website. Uh, and if you're interested in any industry metrics uh, that we are putting out, you can go to live.forkites.com. All right, a lot of great information on that website. Glenn Kepke, Senior Vice President of Customer Success at Forkites, thank you so much. And everyone, stay tuned. We have got so much more for you for the rest of the day and throughout the week, so stay tuned.